chair. We're now live on YouTube. Um, so would you like me to do a roll call of committee members? Yeah, welcome back, everybody. Um, yeah, we, uh, we'll we just have a, a roll call to see who's run away. <laughs> so I'll begin with Councillor Wibley. I am still here. OK, Councillor Davey. Uh, I'm still here, but I have to go at just before 12. Councillor de Saram. I, I have returned. <laughs> Councillor Jackson. I think she had to run away um, yeah. an hour or so ago. Okay. Councillor Moulding. Um, we have Brian Norris trying to join us. I don't think he's with us anymore. Um, Sally Twiss. Yep, I'm here. Okay. Kerry Ann Briggs. Colin Buchan. Yeah, he had to go as well. Uh, Phil Carrigan. Louise Cole. Penny Lewis. And Ellie Pang. Okay, thank you very much, Alicia. Um, it is a comfort to know that even though some people have had to leave us, uh, in this electronic environment, um, we still have more people attending today than we would were we holding it at Blackdown House. So that's that's great. Um, and also, I just noticed my jumper does swirly things on the uh, on the camera. So apologies if that's uh, messing with anybody's head. Okay, um, we'll now hear from uh, Tim uh, Daphorn from um, about his work with uh, Wild Exmouth. Hi everybody, I'm back I think. Everyone can hear me? Um, we can. Can everybody see that screen? Um, uh, not at this point, no. There you go. Ah, there we go, brilliant, thank you. We got there, well done Tim. Okay, so sorry about that, I got caught out by, bizarrely, by a screensaver on my laptop. That's what happened earlier. Um, so it's probably a good thing you didn't have to look at me for too long. Um, so Wild Exmouth, we had an update in back in February about the, the project, and it's been another challenging, obviously challenging time for, for Wild Exmouth. Um, we had to go back to the lottery and uh, get permission to, to rejig what we were going to deliver this year. Um, for those of you that aren't aware of it, Wild Exmouth is a three-year project funded um, in the most part by Heritage Fund and then the second funding it comes from East Devon District Council and then uh, really valuable funding from Exeter Town Council and Devon County Council. Um, so I'm just going to, these are the kind of headings that I'm going to go and try and get through this as quickly as I can so that you can get to the kind of bare bones of what we've achieved this year. Um, and also to make sure there's space to talk about Wild Honiton, which is the kind of next wild town in, in, our, in our project, Wild Town project. So um, just briefly to say, these are the kind of main areas that the, the Wild Access project's working on. Um, so it's all about getting people out, engaging with nature, making positive action for, for wildlife and nature, doing campaigns work and improving the mapping and access for for those that live in the town. And it's very much like, very much, uh, a blueprint for what we could do for lots of towns um, around the district. So this is the first of what we hope is is many kind of projects that are based on nature connection, nature recovery around different towns um, in the district. So Exmouth being the biggest one got, got our resources first, um, but we hope to scale it up to other ones. So anything you see in this presentation, you think, oh, I'd like to see that happening in my town, um, then, you know, come and speak to us. Um, Will's going to be talking about the Wild Honiton project later on. Um, but, you know, this is fundamentally is about linking people to an improved habitat for nature. Um, just the simplest thing. We know that it has massive impacts on um, biodiversity, but it also has a massive impact on people's health and well-being and their quality of life. Um, so that's, you know, the, the, ba the basics, that's what it's all about. Um, for Wild Access, we had four themes. So you can see here, uh, we have themes around being active, um, themes around what you can do for nature at home, 
um, making improvements around the town and then providing lots of opportunities for people to to learn about um, their outdoors, what's on their doorstep. So those are the themes that we're working towards. So for this year, um, if we take a kind of calendar year from, from February, really, from when we last, I last updated you, um, we've seen some amazing growth in, in volunteering. Um, so we've actually launched some Orchard Guardian projects. So you remember last year I talked about the three new orchards we planted at Carters Avenue, Lower Holston Farm and Point in View Chapel. We've now assigned six um, Orchard Guardian volunteers who look after those those trees for the first three or four years. Um, so that's been a, a real um, kind of benefit from, from lockdown. People have been looking for things to do probably solo, solo volunteering really. Um, but we've now got 40 registered volunteers for the project, which is um, what our target was over the three years to get to that point. They're not necessarily all active at the moment, but we've got you've got those those registered volunteers now. Um, so during this year, we'll be planting 65 um, new orchard trees in two new locations. We're hoping to do one location in Holsden Ward um, and one uh, orchard at the bottom of Lower Holsden, so an extension of that. Um, we had some really good events this year. Again, same COVID safe, family bookable events all the way through through the years. So we had things like bat walks, pond dipping sessions. Um, we even tried a webinar, uh, B webinar. Um, we're going to be launching the green space map, which I'm going to show you sh shortly. Um, and we also had a massive growth of our My Patch for Nature campaign. So our signups are nearly up to 400 this year, which is where people pledge a patch of their own um, own space for nature, whether it's a window box or a garden or plant a tree. Um, that's had a, a big increase this year, which has been great. Um, and then we managed to, even within lockdown, we did 16 volunteer days. Um, we haven't touched on volunteering much today in, as part of this forum, but we have recovered volunteering in within the restrictions of, of the tiered system. So we have volunteering with groups of five people with one ranger to, to be within the rule of six. Um, so we managed to recover 16 of those days this year. Um, and when we've been growing our newsletter um, audience as well by producing several newsletters throughout throughout this pandemic. Um, so just quickly on the, the uh, My Patch for Nature project, which I would see as something that we could scale up around the whole district. Um, people sign up, they give us their postcode, um, they say what they're going to do for wildlife, and then we create a Google map of all these locations to create um, a kind of map of where those wild spaces are within the town. And you can see the different types of things that people have been pledging to do. Um, and you can see now from February, it's changed quite a bit, but this is the map of Exmouth. Um, so all those different icons you see is a household who have pledged something for nature. They've all received their free wildflower seeds. Um, some people have done uh, planted their wildflower seeds. Some people have done a multiple things. Um, they've got some of some of them have got their special names on on this map. But you can see that through our website. You'll be able to to look at that. Um, we're hoping to get up to 2,000 by the end of the year. So. Uh, we want to try and cover 2,000 square meters of pledged space for wildlife within the town. Um, but it's a very simple idea, and it's something that we could, with with um, small amounts of money, I think you could scale up this My Patch for Nature idea across the district, which would have a massive impact on um, people's engagement and biodiversity. So really great, great campaign. It's been a real success, and it's relatively cheap um, to get started and to um, get people engaged with. So um, earlier on, I, I noted down what I was going to say for volunteering, what we're going to call it. But um, I thought about Richie Sunak's um, Eat Out to Help Out. And I thought we should really call our volunteering um, Get Out to Help Out. Um, because we know that getting out and into nature is really good for people. So the volunteering this year, we've seen, obviously, the Orchard Guardian work has grown. We've had people helping pack our wildflower seeds. Um, we've had four or five sessions restoring the pond in, in Fear Park. One of our volunteers has been making bird boxes for us during lockdown, um, and they're keen to help with some of our event support. But obviously, with the COVID, that's been a bit tricky to, to get have extra numbers of staff.
staff or volunteers at events because of the, the restrictions. Um, and they've been helping out with, with our tree planting. So even within the pandemic, we've been able to engage our volunteers in solo volunteering during the really um, difficult part of the lockdown or group volunteering with five of them um, when the restrictions eased um, later on in, in the summer. Um, so we mentioned earlier about our events. These are the, this is the range of um, events we did this summer. Um, again, when you say see family there written down, it means family or household. It's not, you can still, we had lots of people that would book that maybe didn't have children. Um, but the idea was just trying to get people the sense of a household, a bubble, a family can come out and book that event and they're not going to be sharing it with anybody else. Um, and that's what enabled people to feel confident to come out. Um, so we ran over, we ran more events than we agreed with the lottery. Um, so that's a, a really good, um, a good success for us, even in this pandemic, to be able to deliver those things. Um, so, John, you had a question. Did you want to ask a question now, or? Only just to say that this is a, a excellent illustration of the uh, rewilding and nature recovery. Um, report that we took to cabinet a little while ago so Tim and his team have been really pioneering on this and we're joining up with street scene as well so it's really great to hear how you're pushing this uh, agenda forward Tim. Cheers thanks thanks John yeah I mean one of the one of the interesting things that did my patch for nature we in the in April we agreed with street scene to leave lots more long grass areas in three distinct parks within Exmouth. Um, and that was approximately 30,000 square meters of, of areas which were originally short mown and left to go long uh, for nature. We've done, we've done surveys on those and we're really supporting streets in how to um, increase the diversity within those grass. And so streets in have been a real key partner for, for that town wide kind of biodiversity work. Um, so the other thing I wanted to just quickly mention was our artist in residence. Um, so we've got um, Anne-Marie Carhain, who's our artist in residence for the project. She's been leading on our Fruit Roots project to plant orchards, get the community engaged in, in fruit roots, foraging roots, tree planting throughout the year. Um, and this is what we've got plan planned for, for the coming year. So we're going to be doing some workshops for volunteers around looking after trees and grafting new apple trees. We're going to be extending the Holston Orchard with the National Trust, another key partner of ours. Um, and then we're going to be producing the fruit route map so people can then follow where all these orchards are um, and explore um, like a ribbon, I guess. Orchard. Think of it as a ribbon that's flowing through Exmouth that's got orchards dotted along it. Um, and then we want to do our final constellation orchard, which is where we offer free fruit trees to a different ward within Exmouth. So we're hoping this year that we can roll that out to another 15 people who can have um, have an apple tree or a fruit tree in their garden that, w that becomes part of our constellation orchard. Um, one of the other thing that I've been working on recently is this the Wild Exmouth um, map. So you can see on the screen here is the draft map, uh, which we'll be giving out to every household within Exmouth. Um, this is designed to be inspiring kind of something you can be proud of but also to help people explore their their local environment so um councillor arnott was talking about the jurassic coast you know that starts in exmouth um the excess tree which is a hugely important wildlife and recreation area is on the doorstep of exmouth and the pearl bed heaths are next to the exmouth but the other important thing is how people enjoy the town the green spaces within the town so this map is going to be part of that um, information kind of a campaign to get people to realize where their parks are, realize where they can cycle safely. Um, this will be launched in the new years, but I'm just put up a draft map there for you to be able to, to see it. Um, it's, this is not the final draft, but it's pretty close to, to the final draft. You can even see a Stuart Line cruise there going along the coast. Um, again, social marketing, um, has been really good this year. Um, I can say that the, my patch nature has gone up. The newsletter subscribers is up to 500. 
um, and our Facebook following within the town has, has grown a lot. Probably about 100 people a month are signing up to Wild Exmouth. So by the end of the project, we will be up to about 2,000 people that are following a project. Um, and again, similar to Wild East Devon, we've been putting out lots of online content um, that engages people, inspires them to go outdoors. So I think later on, I've got a, a video I'm hoping to show you. So we'll see if the technology works. Um, and this is a video that we put up on social media a um, few, few weeks ago. Um, and this is the type of thing that really engages people. Um, they can share it, they talk about it, they comment on it. It's a really great tool um, that we've been using across all our social media channels. Um, and this is the one, so it takes about a minute or so, um, but hopefully you can hear the sound on this. Um, So we didn't hear the sound on that, but that was fantastic. You couldn't hear the sound on that, okay? No, no but that was that was brilliant, and it's always good to have a reminder not to touch the electric fence. So <laughs> yes, that's probably the only walk where we've had to had to encounter electric fences. Um, that's, so that's brilliant. Thank you. I can send the the link to that video anyway, so people can so can watch it at a later date. Um, so we've had to go back to lottery and create a recovery plan for Wild Exodus to enable us to cope with the changes. Um, so this is just a, some of a combination of some of the things we're trying to achieve this year. Um, it includes launching a training fund for volunteers. So this is something lottery are quite keen on. So we've not been able to do face-to-face -face training for volunteers. So we're launched, we've just launched, you probably have seen the press release last week, uh, we're launching a grant fund for volunteers to do a little bit of training that then leads to some environmental action project for the town um, and councillor Davey is going to helping us with the, the uh, application panel um, to decide on that so that's one of those really distinct changes to the project where we're going to be providing money or funding to enable people to do um, to take environmental action in the town um, you've seen the map that that will be distributed next year the campaign work will be working with the men's shed to to uh, produce more bird boxes for the town. Um, we'll be looking at installing the signage for the valley parks, um, and we'll also be we've been facilitating the creative cabin, so they're going to be coming and delivering some events for Wild Access next year. Um, don't want to read through it, but you'll be able to see the it, it, this um, afterwards. Um, and if you want to. Uh, any questions or want to put your hand up, I can answer any of those, but I hope that's been a kind of whistle stop tour to, to Wild Exmouth for, the, for this year. Thank you so much, Tim. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, just one thought that uh, strikes me, when you talk about distributing the, the green space map, it would be great if we could have that 
uh, displayed in sort of various places in the town, maybe. Um, so people are, uh, who visit the town could see that as well. I think that's that's a really really cool thing. Um, yeah, I was going to say. Uh, sorry, I should have said that. I should have said that the map, although it's been pa produced as a paper version for residents, it's also mm. going to be installed in four locations as an interpretation map around the town. That's brilliant. Um, so two two in two in the coastal areas and then two inland for residents. So it will be reproduced in slightly different way as an interpretation map. That's brilliant. Um, thank you very very much for all of that. That's um, that's quite inspiring. Um, Councillor Jeff Young. Thank you, Tim, for that. Um, I, I need to um, uh, contact you to see how you do that uh, map with um, the photographs popping up because that, that uh, looks uh, really good. And it, um, can that go on to, um, I, I'm just wondering if it can go on to Facebook um so you can sort of link into it um so you can we can have um uh walks um sort of advertise on facebook and then people can go on to it and uh, that that'd be good one of the things that um keeps cropping up in my portfolio is that um our car park's been full on the uh, uh pepper bed heaths uh and we we're trying to stop people from using their cars. So any footpaths and ways of getting from the town of Exmouth onto the uh, Pepper Bed Heath without having to use the car, that'd be great. Um, I want to know a bit more about the um, funding of um, uh, the scheme. Uh, I, I understand we had uh, substantial funding from uh, the uh, lottery. Um, are we going to be able to get funding for the other towns or have we got other plans of uh, raising funds uh, f for the other towns? And now, obviously, um, this is a, um, a exploratory um, exercise and a lot of the uh, lessons that we've learned in Exmouth can uh, be transferred over uh, to the other towns. Uh, but I do wonder, um, how how the funds are going and if we can um, uh, and if we've got funding for the other towns thank you yeah so in answer to the funding so, so the heritage lottery capped their contribution that's uh, currently at 65000 pounds for these types of small projects that's a small project for them big project for us um and we have drawn down some funding from Exeter Town Council. They put in approximately £12,000 over the length of the project. Um, and then we've taken some money from our reserves as match funding. Um, so each town depends on the outputs of the project and the size of the town will pretty much dictate whether the lottery want to um, fund additional towns. They're probably unlikely to want to fund a direct replacement for Wild Exmouth in Exmouth but they would probably consider another town as being a different um, different location, different community. So if we wanted to employ extra members of staff, then I, I would suggest we need to look at external funding from the lottery. If we're going to run it within our resources of our team, um, which would require changes to, to our priorities, um, then we would need less money, but then we'd have to juggle that with you know the impacts on our other areas of work so i think yeah we, we will look to see if we can get external funding if it means that the project will be more successful okay thank you very very much for that uh councillor de Sarum. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I think, uh, Tim, it's quite amazing what your team has been doing uh, in, in Exmouth. Um, really, really impressive. And I think that because we are in a very urban setting, my, my patch for nature is something that is very positive and I think will contribute greatly to the well-being of the town. And I'm also very interested to hear about this environmental action that you're thinking of doing, because I think that's, that's something very positive. And I think, as the Chair mentioned, the maps, the Wild Exmouth maps will be uh, very, very helpful in signposting people for the, for the way to go. So uh, thank you, Tim. A, a wonderful, well worth waiting for presentation. Cheers, thank you. Yeah, cheers, Bruce. Um, I think, um, yeah, just the way that you were able to show the work that you've done sort of graphically and very simply um, 
was it's really helpful. It's it's um it, it's amazing. Um, Councillor Arnott. Thank you, Chair. Can I just throw back to uh, the Seaton Wetlands, um, which are uh, uh, under Wild East Devon uh, that Tim was talking about beforehand, and just very briefly to offer the most extraordinary uh, <laughs> congratulations. Um, it is ironic, isn't it? This summer, this particular summer, that when everything's gone so horribly wrong, what Seaton Wetlands, which is about a mile and a half that way for me, so I, I, we went walking there a lot, as, was amazing. It was like a dream place because it, did con it combined this wonderful environmental work that East Devon has done with this extraordinary arts offer as well of these outdoor sculptures. I haven't got, my kids aren't quite young enough to have given me grandchildren yet, but I tell you what, they would have loved uh, what was there, these kind of basket weave sculptures. I'm sure that's not the correct technical term, but you know what I mean. And then the degree of activities that have always been down there, they've obviously been more difficult to do over the summer. Um, so, uh, it, Again, we have done, not this summer, because I'm, I'm in the protected category, but we have done a bit of B&B &B here in this house in the past, uh, the previous two years, three years, and um, we have sent people walking in the sea and wetlands from here, and they have absolutely loved it and come back glowing and gone back, I'm sure, to other parts of the country and said, if you go and stay near Collerton or Colliford or Seaton, this is a thing you should do. This will give you a fantastic day out. And it does. Um, so just really, uh, Chair, nothing but just to offer congratulations and, and, and thanks um, you know, on behalf of my end of East Devon. Uh, the, you know, and, and, and more power to your elbow. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Councillor Arna. Yeah, I, I can only echo what's just been said. Not driving and living at the other end of East Devon means that I've, I've not experienced seats and wetlands in the way that I'd like to, but um, I will... I, I will aim to do so. Uh, do we have any more questions? We don't. Well, can I just say, um, as yeah, thank you very, very much, Tim. Th th thank you very much to you and your team, um, as to everybody who's contributed to this. Um, Charlie, so we've come to yeah. the end of agenda item five, I believe now. We have the chair, we're moving on to cultural plans. I'm conscious of the time as well, so I will implore um, my uh, presenters to to sort of really just um, pick up the uh, the highlights because um, I'm conscious people might have to um, to uh, to head on fairly soon. So um, uh, as always, we're over ambitious. Um, sorry, uh, sorry, Paul. Um, we uh, <laughs> failed one of your two main lessons, um, but we're daring to dream, though. Excellent. Can I just say before we go on that we did hope to have Brian Norris here, um, and he has emailed saying that he's unable to get to the meeting, and now he has to go to a uh, um, a medical appointment. But he would like to he'd like us to note the Living Memories Online Archive Film Streaming Project which you'd like all forum members to be aware of. And the links will be in uh, the email that comes out after this. Um, and he's happy to be contacted um, to give a demo of the service. Uh, he, yeah, so he's from Living Memories Online. Um, so thank you for that, uh, Brian. And sorry, you couldn't make it. Although you can't hear me saying this because you're not here. Um, okay, so Charlie. Ruth, agenda Ruth, item Ruth, six, Ruth. going yeah. forward. Charlie, the floor is yours. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Joe. Yeah, it was um, Rita hand over to Ruth, who's going to um, just uh, outline um, the, the, the plans for the gallery for, for next year. So I think she's loading up her. Brilliant. Uh, uh, right. My uh, host disabled participant screen sharing alert is up, Alicia. I'm not sure if that can be changed. Okay. Do you want to? If we can do a little bit of um, moving around on the agenda whilst um, Ruth's sorting that out, I'm conscious of the time. I've got Graham sitting next. He's going to do a verbal update, uh, Chair, with your um, your spot. He can do a um, his verbal update on the theatre. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, sorry, oh, I'll jump the gun. Sorry. Okay, that was best laid plans and all that. I'll shut up. <laughs> okay, so Ruth. <laughs> 
Okay, I'll be really quick, Graham. Thank you for letting me come back. Um, so yes, I just wanted to share our exciting plans for 2021, which are very responsive to what happened in 2020. And I think um, will give the gallery and our program um, stability, interest, um, and the dyna dynamism that it needs to thrive. Um, interesting what Paul was saying about his passion for the arts or his interest in terms of amateur arts and lit literature, it all resonates with what we're doing and that really resonates with where the funding is as well. So it's critical that we keep that in mind. Um, so we're going to be delighted to be welcome our audiences back next year. We're going to have exhibitions, events and activities. Um, so following the challenges of 2020, our 2021 programme in many ways captures our changing planet, addressing global questions from a local level. We'd like to invite communities to join us to explore complex issues such as equality and environmental justice while celebrating the importance of individual creative expression and the joy it can bring. So this year, we turn our attention back to Thelma Holbert and the important contribution she made to 20th century British art. It was the spirit of her creative community and network that we are going to reignite as we come back together to enjoy and celebrate our museums and galleries. Um, so we're going to start the year with a really brilliant film. It's going to be on loan from the Arts Council collection. It's the first time we've ever hosted a, an audio visual installation by Mikhail Karakis, who's a Greek London based artist. Um, I won't go into huge amounts of detail about it, but the, the main themes are um, renewable energy, climate change, community, song, um, participation. So we're going to be, this project is um, going to be mirrored with community uh, children in Honiton. Um, and then we go into our big uh, blockbuster working with the London group. So it's a great show. We've got contemporary artists from the London group who've made new work specifically for us. Then we've got some private loans of uh, Walter Stick at Passmore. We've got our Thelma Holbert collection on display. Thelma is a real spotlight turning on to Thelma at the moment. So we're capitalising on that. Um, and obviously we want to be seen as spearheading that academic thought. But it's a really fun show. We're going to have a lot of workshops around it as well for the community to get involved in. Um, Ingrid Pollard, this is a bit of a clue for us to have. Um, so this is working with Devon and Exeter Institute, Libraries Unlimited, and uh, the Geography Department of the University of Exeter. Um, so we're going to be having a brand new body of work created by Ingrid Pollard here in the gallery. There's going to be a host of symposiums happening around it, activities and workshops. And also we've been invited by Honiton Town Council to um, deliver Honiton Pride, which resonates really strongly with England's practice. So um, we'll be excited about that. Um, and then back to this, the only project that was the casualty of 2020 was the Mike Perry. Um, so Mike Perry is an environmental artist. He does a series of uh, recording uh, wet deserts, the landscapes that we see as national parks, but actually they're man-made landscapes. And, and he has this uh, raft of, sort of archival material where he, he kind of archives his documentation of plastics found in the sea and creates this kind of quite beautiful artwork. So that's when we're in the gallery. Simultaneously, that's when the Abode of Love comes back in. We were doing an environmental project down at the Abode of Love. And then that's when the cabin puts on a new hat so it's going to become the climate cabin. And that, again, is going to be driving East Devon District Council's commitment to um, Devon's climate change awareness. As Charlie was saying earlier, absolutely key is art, PR and branding and we, that's the messaging of the creative cabin and that's the message of the climate cabin so we'll be working with a really dynamic designer uh, and marketing team to really get the message out there but bed it in and make it relevant and resonant for East Evans uh, communities to understand their impacts on the environment and what they can actually do in real life terms to change as a project we're hoping to deliver with Tim and his team as well. Um, and then finally going into what's happening in the gallery later on in the year. Um, we've got um, our dish offer again. So we've got art, math for short. So we've got um, art history lectures in the gallery um, for our audiences on a Tuesday, which will be filming for um, those audiences that can't still come into the gallery itself. Um, that's a wish stop store. I hope to see you all with us next year in the gallery and out and about. Thank you very much, Rose. Um, that was brave, um, but <laughs> um, I think we, we, we got a flavour of all of the exciting things. I'm particularly excited by the Children of Unquiet film. Um, 
and and I I will make every effort to uh, to get there. Um, does anybody have any questions for me? Chair, I can just jump in. I was so it goes back to my point about that's a really really exciting program that Ruth put forward, mm. and we're incredibly lucky to have some of those exhibitions, you know, coming to us. And I think all that building, that sense of anticipation, you know, is going to be key. You know, that campaigning thing about come on, let's you know we've got this come and support it, come and see it, you know, there is a real diversity there. And I think, um, you know, we, um, you know, we've got a real opportunity to, to, to seriously promote um, the, the programme uh, for next year. Definitely. And I think in these times, it's, um, it's, it's more ideal than ever. Um, mm. Definitely. Okay, so um, should we hear from Graham now? Yeah, can do. We're going to leave our wills right to the end. <laughs> Sorry, Will. <laughs> Don't worry, Will. Save the best for last. Good morning, Graham. Hello, and good morning to everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, what I wanted to talk about was to basically explain wh where we're at as regards to the theatre. Um, and going back in March, um, we were just about to start our busiest period, in fact, and because of the success of the summer play season last year, we decided that we were going to put the uh, plays on sale early. So a week before COVID, uh, they were on sale, and the reaction was really quite fantastic. So we were hitting the very busiest period with loads of shows on, and then uh, COVID happened and we were unable to open. The first challenge that we had was actually we were cancelling over 20 shows. And in 10 years, we've actually only ever had to cancel two shows. Uh, one was for illness and one for another reason. So we were quite lucky that we actually had Spectrix, the computerized system, uh, which we've had. Um, and we've, we've had that for over a year. It's one of the most advanced, if not the most advanced, uh, box office system that West End theatres have. Uh, big venues, small venues, art centres um, actually use Spectrix. And we were able to do the refunds incredibly quickly and contact all our customers and explain the situation and what was happening. <laughs> It was very disappointing, obviously, not to be open, but also of the fact that actually things were looking so good. We had a show that was on in November, and it was already sold out in March. Um, that was just quite incredible. So we were hoping as the months went on and as things happened, that we might actually be able to open in November and not actually have to cancel the show. Uh, but unfortunately, as you all know, um, that wasn't the case. We've had to get the venue ready and uh, risk assessments, uh, COVID rules and regulations. And our plan is that we will be opening the venue um, next year in February. And we will be doing things quite differently to what we've done in the past. We are looking at talks in the afternoon, smaller productions, co-productions, working with different people. Um, the good news is, and there is good news, um, over the first 20 shows that we cancelled, 19 have rebooked. So the diary in the next coming years is looking incredibly busy. Um, part of the recovery is looking at how we survive and how we move forward. And we feel that we will be doing lots of things very differently. In the past, we've worked successfully as basically a hire only venue. So anybody, amateur, professional, sing, uh, single production, touring production, would come to the venue and hire it. Um, we actually now believe that moving forward, we will be doing much more of box office splits and also actually much more co-productions um, and actually working with different production companies um, where the risk is taken out for them and for actually the venue and that we're working much more closely together. 
Um, looking at the future, um, there's great concerns of will, will we lose our audiences and will they come back and how quickly they will come back. Um, I strongly believe it will take some time, but I actually do believe that the public do want to be entertained. When you look at theatre and you see that it covers all ages and their well-being and their health, it's really been disheartening that we haven't been able to put on a panto um, this year. Panto appeals from three-year-olds to 93-year-olds, and it's a joy to see all ages coming together. And many times, it's the first time type of entertainment and theater experience that children and youngsters have. So doing things differently, We've got a panto on in June next year. We've got four performances. It's a professional production. And we did actually try to put a panto on uh, under COVID conditions. The, we were actually working with three different production companies trying to knock down all the barriers and hurdles of doing it. The problem has been it's a one-way system. Do you have an interval? Can people mix? Can you serve drinks, etc.? So all these problems we were trying to resolve and get around them. The problem is there are a few pantos up and down the country. Um, unfortunately, if one of the cast gets COVID, they will have to self-isolate and the bubble that's been created, so will the company. So the entire show will then go. So the risks and the problems that that would cause are just so great. We believe that starting in January and marketing and selling the new things that we've got on offer, um, we will have to have and comply with all the rules and regulations, which at the moment would allow us to have 80 to 90 people, depending on the layout and depending on the production. But we actually believe that once we start doing that and we build on it, that people will feel comfortable and safe and reassured about coming back to the venue. There isn't a better time that actually to be entertained, for people to laugh, to people to sing and dance, uh, and actually have thought-provoking plays. The, the, the demand is greater. It's, it's greater than ever before. Um, and therefore, we believe that in the future, um, once we can get open, up and running, um, the audiences will return. Um, we will be looking at so many other things that have changed. Um, for instance, as regards buying tickets and box office hours and how much we do it online. And actually, I can see the day that we will not even issue tickets. It will all be done uh, electronically on mobile phones, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, it's about not standing still. It's about being able to adapt and to change. And we've had some time to be able to look at all the things that we do and say, can we actually do that better? Who are the people we aren't reaching? And how can we reach them? And how can we entertain them? And I believe that actually speaking to other venues and other production companies, that's actually what the whole of the business is actually doing right now. It's saying, we did this and it worked, but how can we make that better? How can we reach the people that aren't coming into the venue, uh, etc.? The other thing is that when you take something away and it's not there at all, when it comes back, um, it should actually be stronger, it should be better, and it should actually be improved. And I believe that the service that we provide at the theater will be just that. And I can actually already see that in the productions and shows that we're in discussions with. And actually, you know, when there are so many people out of work, not just actors and act, uh, actors and the crew and the cast, it's all the people that back them and support them. Um, they're all out of work. So they're actually having new ideas and thinking, can we, can we put this show on? We've got this idea. Um, and so I've actually discovered that in the last few months, 
that there's much more product out there and ready to go when venues can get back to anything that's as normal um, and, and, and open and entertain the public. So although it's been very tough, it's been very difficult, um, it's given us the opportunity to look and review everything that we do and see what is valued. And I do believe that we will get through it, we will get uh, bolder, we will change and we will be different, but we can build on the success that we had. And we will start uh, in the new year, in January, uh, with a marketing campaign, with all um, the emails and uh, all the customers that we've got on record, contacting them, explaining the situation, the difference that we're at, and what actually we're providing. Um, and we think, we think we will get through this uh, and things will actually get better. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think that with the great white hope that's coming over the horizon, I think once people have the confidence to go um, and get out there again, I think you'll, I don't think it'll be a surprise to you, but I, I think people will, will, will be itching to get out and to, and to, to go to the theatre and go to music and, and do everything that they haven't been. And I think you're right, again, to draw the uh, comparison to music. I know that um, it's been a very, very creative time for people because I've had a lot of time to be creative and with certain hardship comes um, creative thoughts, you know. Uh, so I think um, I, I, I think going forward, you your, your optimism is not misplaced. Um, we will now, uh, Peter Faithful, do you have a question? But I don't know what other people were thinking, but up the road from the Manor Pavilion, there is a perfectly good outdoor venue called The Knoll, which has been used in the past as a slab of concrete purpose built for putting a stage on. Um, used to be used for the Folk Week and Caribbean Night. And to me, that's a, a excellent place to have outdoor theater. Um, where there's room for open, uh, proper spacing. I mean, I was looking down that road anyway, long before coronavirus came along, but it's, it, it would have worked well as a place to have put on plays outside. I don't know if anyone else is thinking that road. Um, thank you, Councillor Faithful, not knowing the, um, the area or, or, or um, exactly what that space is. I mean, is that something that you've considered, Graham, or is that not something that's... It, it's really interesting hearing that because I've actually been in contact with different companies who would never have dreamt of doing an outside production. And they are now looking at doing those sorts of things um, and actually being able to travel and in parks and in spaces. And I just think... The, the three companies that I'm referring to, um, they, they would never have dreamt of doing that, but they now want to go out and reach people. So I actually think that the product of theatre and entertainment um, is, is, is bigger than ever before. And actually, people aren't just saying, oh, well, it's going to be in a theatre. Actually, what can we do? Where, what is the open space? that we can entertain and do that. Um, and I think we will see more and more of that happening. Can I check, can I, oh, let me just spin that around, just um, come back on that. Um, one of the things I was proposing to do, we've got a new um, events officer, uh, Angela Gordon-Lennox, who's in post. And one of the things we've started to discuss with her um, is about uh, how her role can help support our sort of cultural activities and events. And I think, outdoor theatre, outdoor performances is the exactly the sort of area where we can have some synergy working between ourselves. Um, and I think uh, I, I've said to Angela, it would be really useful for her to come to the next uh, forum meeting to talk through her event strategy, 
how it links in with our sort of cultural agenda, um, how we can get sort of value added. Um, so that might be a good opportunity to pick up on Peter's point because um, that that may be the opportunity to make use of these um, outdoor spaces where we can sort of say add, add value. Absolutely brilliant. That's great. Um, thank you so much, Graham. Oh, uh, Councillor Arnott, you have a question. Yeah, thank you, Chair, very much. And uh, thank you so much, Graham. That was really, really fascinating. And uh, uh, good luck for, for all reopening next year. And I'm sure it will go brilliantly. Not surprised there's a backlog of demand. Um, I've got quite a lot of friends who are actors and directors, and you're absolutely right. They are really considering, as Peter has said, indeed, uh, going outdoors. They'll go anywhere over the next uh, few years. Uh, this has um, a lot of vanities around uh, the arts, but particularly performing arts, have been lost. Uh, a lot of performers who've been put off doing stuff by their agents in the past are now going, actually, no, why don't I do? Why don't I play this small space? Well, you know, that's what I wanted to do in the first place. A couple of questions, if I may. First of all, um, I think your capacity is about 250, 260. What is that too small to allow you to host, uh, both in terms of the incoming artist uh, and indeed for you to be able to break even? And is it possible for, in my day, doing this kind of thing, which was a long time ago, um, one used to be involved in uh, small or medium uh, scale Arts Council backed tours of certain types of theatre. It was, it was a little a little bit more edgy, but it wasn't totally alienating. And they would offer guarantees against loss. And you'd see the same show would go. There was a whole network, wasn't there? It would go, I don't know, it used to go to Merlin Theatre in Froome, and then it would go to Bridport, and then it would go, something would go off to the, I think it was the Plough in Torrington. So there was a, there was a network of touring venues which I think were about this size. So just interested to inquire about that, please. Thank you, Chair. Sure, absolutely. The, the, the venue seats 277 with a normal four layout. Uh, we're very lucky in the respect that we can adapt. Um, we can remove a number of uh, front row seats and we can use an orchestra pit, but four is 277. Um, Obviously, it's a completely different ball game if you're suddenly then reduced to playing to 90 and what product is out there. Um, this business is renowned for being, uh, uh, being able to adapt and change, and I'm sure you, you, you know all about that. Um, so I've had shows and producers and companies um, that we deal with saying, well, if we, if we do the show, uh, we can reduce it to a 90 minute production and we can do three a day. Um, and that will bring us up to nearly the 300. So we're back on, on a, a, an even kill. The, the problem with the Corona situation is we've, we would have to deep clean from one audience coming out to the next audience coming in and the, the problems and complications that that would cause. But it's, you don't, you don't get anywhere by standing still and you've got to be able to adapt. I believe that the venue will, we, we are adapting, we won't stand still. And this is how we're looking at saying, what, how else can we do these things, et cetera, et cetera. Very interesting about your touring and about the shows that are on. Very often we'll get um, an offer of a production that is traveling down into the Southwest, is already booked at a number of venues, and therefore it makes sense for us to take uh, the show um, while they're on tour. Again, we're more than happy to do that and willingly to, and we'll, we'll be able to do it. The problem of, as regards income is not only have we just lost the hiring for the actual venue, but as Charlie mentioned, it's, uh, the ticket sales and the commission that you take from that, which is a standard rate across the board for most theatres. Um, it's the bar take, it's the ice cream sales. Um, and when you don't have any of that, that then obviously then causes the problem. Um, but, but we will get there. We will definitely get there. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, I think the message is hang in there. And um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for everybody's questions. Um, 
Charlie, shall we yeah, move on? Last one, last one, Chair. It's Will. He's sat there very patiently. Thank um, you so very much, Will. Very, personal very much Will. Well. You're doing a great job. Um, but uh, you can't uh, keep Graham off the stage for too long. Um, so, yeah, Will, Will I, I, I know Will, um, Will abbreviate his presentation because I think, um, you know, everyone's thinking about sort of lunch, but a really, this is a really important project. So um, over, over to Will. He's got a short presentation, I think. Um, and, um, yeah, I'll hand over to him. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Charlie. Are we okay with screen sharing, Will? Ah, we can't hear you. Go make sure we can hear Will. Yeah, your screen is being shared, Will, but we can't hear you. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, that's great. Ah, wonderful. Excellent. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for um, giving up your precious time for me. Um, I will make it brief as I realize we're all thinking of lunch and sandwiches, et cetera. But um, uh, just um, to in quickly introduce myself, I am the um, engagement and participation officer for, um, for Wiley 7, the countryside team working directly under Tim, Tim and um, with Charlie and with um, everyone else in our um, service um, to lead on um, our events, our volunteering, and, and uh, most recently taking on uh, the lead of this Wild Honiton project, which I'll very briefly just uh, discuss. Um, hopefully, um, some people have heard of it, some people not, might not have. It's um, uh, going to be a two-year project aimed at improving the green space and residence connection to green spaces within the town of Honiton. Um, if you could cast your mind back 20 minutes um, to think about uh, Tim's presentation about Wild Exmouth, we're really building on the success of that project um, and as part of our Wild Towns initiative, moving that across now to our next focus, which will be Honiton. Um, I think and um, hope you can all agree that Honiton is a deserving place. It's in probably in need of a bit of a nature boom. Um, we're going to look to embed the uh, nature recovery network principles within the EDDC council plan, as well as various service plans in the town um, to give it a real, um, a real natural kick. Um, and of course, uh, the presence of Blackdown House being at, uh, at Honiton will, um, and uh, building on the success of the inner Honiton project um, hopefully leads to a natural conclusion that this is the next step so um, that's what we're going to be doing um, we're going to focus on those two themes of nature recovery and nature connection um, here's the key areas that we've outlined um, so I won't talk through all of them but some key areas obviously the round ball wood and Gitchen common um, owned by the Coomer state um, really nice places Honiton bottom community nature reserve is our nature reserve uh, which we, we obviously love and is it's it's wonderfully um, uh, wonderfully put position within the town for people to go out and use. Um, Little Town Green, Higher Brand Lane and the Glen um, have um, some ownership with uh, EDDC and our street scene team who we're looking with, who we're uh, looking to work with very closely on this. Um, and then there's some other sites as well, such as the garden at Thelma Hilbert Gallery and um, Offwell Woods, um, which me and um, some of our team are looking to um, develop as part of this Wild Honiton project. So if you're not that familiar with Honiton, um, I'll, I'll share some more information after, but in the interest of time, um, timeline um, is looking like this. We are on target with how we're hoping to um, advance this project essentially we've held consultation now we have those stats back which I'll briefly talk through um, in a second um, from the community um, I'm now um, looking to draw up a detailed plan of delivery ideas um, structures and options so we can work out how best to do this project so just to um, reiterate that we're very much still in the planning phase of it uh, but we're ready to go in order to get that plan um, up and running um, so um, from next year onwards we're hoping to start and deliver the project from April onwards so from 2021 to 2023 um, uh, that's the, that's it so the, the consultation came back um, we ran it for six weeks we had 271 complete questionnaires so I'm really pleased about how that um, came back with um, so similar to the numbers that we had for Exmouth obviously from a much smaller town as well so pretty pleased with that um, interestingly, um, some highlights to pick up on are that 94% um, of the people that responded to our questionnaires um, were under the age of 60, um, most of them between 40 and 49. So um, a real, um, uh, what we wouldn't necessarily expect to get involved in, in nature consultations or um, for surveys, we normally get a much older um, average age. So we yeah, are really pleased with how, um, how we're engaging with a different audience in Honiton. I think we can definitely use that to our advantage. 
Um, some yeah, key highlights coming from the consultation that we'll use in the plan going forward. Um, 53% of people are satisfied with the amount of outdoor spaces, 31% dissatisfied, so definitely room for improvement there. Um, a connection to nature, but not necessarily a connection to Honiton's outdoor spaces. So a mandate for us to improve um, for, uh, for people connection as well as nature connection. Um, four places that people, um, of course, was um, Honiton Bottom Community Nature Reserve, uh, but also the Ramble Woods, the Glen, the Giffage, um, key areas that people were particularly interested in. Um, and walking and spending time with family, social activity seems to be a very key area. So I realise I'm going 100 miles an hour over here, but um, um, I'll make this available for um, everyone to have a look at afterwards. Um, in, uh, interestingly, what people necessarily thought that were more, more important were the um, were areas around improving nature, so uh, more wildflower meadows, bird boxes, tree planting, all good stuff that Wally Stevan, um, the countryside team, are particularly good at anyway. So that's really pleasing that we can make those um, adjustments going forward. Um, 40% said we could make it easier for them for, to access it. So as well as the nature connection, the people connection is important to people as well. So further um, solidifying our mandate that we can use those two areas to really improve Honiton and the green space going forward. So that's consultation. Um, to go with the plan proposal, um, uh, although it's not been properly written yet and it was off, going to be off the back of these presentations and any questions that you guys might have um, or any comments rather. Um, so year one, we're going to really focus on the nature recovery. So we're going to work out how we can um, focus the creation and setup of the network, um, make it as good as possible for nature, create those nature corridors, um, look at rewilding um, with our colleagues at Street Scene in particular um, and work out how perhaps we can create some kind of circular route. That's what we're particularly keen on, how we can get a, a, a source of, a, similar to learning the lessons from Wild Exmouth, Tim's um, amazing map that we saw um, about half an hour ago or so, and working up a similar one for Honiton, getting people out, out and about, using how we can um, Get the place, um, get the places as good as possible for nature first, and then year two we're going to build on that framework that hopefully we would have successfully delivered in year one to target particular groups of people in Honiton, and that's where we're going to work with really um, key partners to develop the arts, to develop um, uh, experimental and cultural um, different ideas to go with the new project. So um, partners like Thelma Holbert Gallery will be really key with this one. When we've already sounded out friends of the Glen. Um, it just uh, it was worth me just saying that our partners that we've already um, sounded out include, um, importantly, the, the owners. So um, we've had firm commitments from uh, Roy Coombs and the um, um, Honiton Town Council. Um, the Coombs State are really keen to work with us. Um, and obviously our colleagues in Street Scene are, are really keen to see this project move forward as well. So um, we, we've got all the, uh, the framework and the groundwork being delivered now, um, are being set up, and then hopefully I can go forward and um, really nail this project plan. Um, so um, with that in mind, we've got options with how we're looking to deliver it. So again, if we can um, hark back to what Tim was saying about funding, about how um, how differently we can deliver projects. So we can either do it within the team. So I'm hopefully going to be taking on a, a more um, a, an active role in coordinating it. And we can either do it by using our um, team members such as John Gardner um, to deliver the practical element of it, Meg Valander to deliver the educational element of it. Um, and, um, and we could, in, in theory, get a project officer involved for, as a different option, um, similar to how we did with Wild Exmouth as well, um, or a mix of the above. So we're not entirely set on how we're going to deliver it yet. I want to do it to maximum uh, to sorry to maximise um, the potential for people and for nature as well. So it's very much dependent on on how how we go forward with that. Um, that was really quick. I didn't realise quite how quick it was going to be, but hopefully that's okay for everyone. Um, uh, plenty more I could say about it, and hopefully um, there'll be more uh, um, more stuff coming forward as we go um, throughout. But um, I'm ha uh, happy to answer any questions or receive any comments. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that. Well, that was um, that was quick, but um, it was extensive, and um, I think we were all well aware of what you're doing. Especially pleased about the participation and the fact that it's a wide ranging age of people, which is always good. Uh, Councillor Young, uh, uh, th through the chair, uh, thank you, Will. Um, that was a um, uh, great presentation. Uh, one of the graphics I queried on is um used a crab is that a freshwater crab or a seawater <laughs> crab or do you know something about uh global warming that we don't um <laughs> that's a, a great question jeff and i'd have to refer to our graphics department at eastern district <laughs> council for that <long. laughs> um yeah but br now bringing the countryside into the town and taking the town out into the countryside 
um, is a theme that seems to be um, going through all of these wild uh, programs. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, so we, we need to concentrate on that now, um, pr promoting the footpaths leading out of the town. Um, uh, I don't think there's any um, um, or many cycleways that we can promote, but um, that would be another option. Um, and we've got the um, otter just down the road. Um, that that river, uh, like all the other rivers in East Devon, uh, is fa fairly heavy polluted. Uh, ha have we got links uh, to tie up with the uh, the uh, those sort of projects that are happening on the uh, on on the Upper Otter area. Thank you, uh, Will. Thank, thank, thank you, much. Councillor John. Yeah, um, just to quickly answer that, um, I'm in touch specifically with um, the Blackdown Hills um, AONB, um, who are I'm really keen um, to get involved in this. Um, Tim um, Youngs, I think his name is, um, we, and Verity Jones. We've been speaking a lot about a lot, a lot about it. They had input into the consultation questions, and um, we're certainly when I talk about the um, the circular route that um, we perhaps might use and the maps, we're hoping to add on extra routes to get people out into their local um, spaces as well. Not least to our nature reserve at um, Nap Cops, and as well go north and onto the upper, upper Otter as well. So lots of ideas, but all centered around. Um, um, Honiton, which is which is good, and, and like you say, it's about bringing the countryside into our urban areas, which um, which Wild Exmouth delivered successfully, and we're hoping to build on that. Oh, what I was going to say also, Chair, I'll pick up just very quickly is um, we're looking to obviously scale this up. Uh, Wild Exmouth has been really successful. Wild, Wild Honiton is obviously the next one on the taxi rank, and. <laughs> the only thing, you know, a much wider rollout um, is obviously our capacity. We're a relatively small team. So, you know, what we want to make sure is that we go and we do a really good job. We can leave a really strong legacy within each town and community through, you know, volunteering network and a commitment from the town to continue to deliver a lot of the project aims and objectives. And then once we're sure on that, then we can obviously move on to, um, you know, the next town, you know, and deal with their sort of very specific, um, you know, issues. So it's a long term commitment, you know, hence we're calling it the Wild Towns Programme. But um, really excited. Honda. Each town presents different challenges. Um, so, um, yeah, looking forward to getting stuck in. Thank you very much, Charlie. And I think, you know, um, seeing the thumbs up there from Councillor Arna, I think that's... Um, it's, you know, it's, it's it's proof that you know, and that we're sort of committed to uh, to doing this going forward because I, I think the, the benefit it brings to everybody in terms of of all of the uh, all of the sorts of benefits, so health and fitness, but also mental health as well. I think that's something that we talked about in the last um, the last forum quite a lot was mental health and the effects that the art can have on it. And I think the way that today has gone and the fact we're just catching up with everybody, we haven't really mentioned it, but I think it's especially important to emphasise um given what we've all been through and what the country's been through and the world um just how important the arts are when it comes to helping people to maintain their mental health and um i think it will be a, a big part of the recovery um do we have any more questions we have no more questions um so i think charlie in terms of your speakers that's um uh, for, for this agenda item that's it yeah yeah all done thanks chair Okie doke. Um, does anybody have any anything else they'd like to say or they'd like to add? Any other business of any sort? John, John Golding. Right, thank you, Chair. Um, we've tried to reflect a lot of this. You've seen a broad range of things to the, uh, today in the uh, statement of intent that went to Council uh, Cabinet last night. And um, what you will see is a lot more detail coming through in the service plan. So when you see the countryside and leisure service plan you'll see a lot more detail on on these things and we really are, are keen to drive them forward because as you've as you alluded to there's so much creative and inspiring stuff here we really want to push this uh, forward so you'll see a lot more of detail in the service plans thank you thank you john um and that's that's really really good to know um yeah uh I will. I'll, I'll thank people now. Thank you, everybody, for attending. I think it's been um, it's been really, really useful to look at what we're doing within the council, 
um, and just massive, massive thanks from me and I know from uh, from Councillor Arnold as well um, for all of the work that you're doing. And um, yeah, I can't can't express. Um, and just you know, just the thing that struck me is the way that people have just been man have just managed to adapt um, at the uh, at, at the drop of a hat and turn what could be a horrible situation into something positive. The positivity in the in the the virtual room today has been um, has, has been quite something. Um, so in terms of setting a next meeting, I don't know if any of you were, were listening in at the break. I think this meeting has been focusing on what, what we've been doing. Um, just having a really brief chat with Charlie, uh, potentially look to have another meeting towards the end of February or early March, um, just to so we can start listening again. Hopefully by then, We'll have a clearer picture of what's going on. Um, well, I'll say the V word, vaccine wise and how, how things are looking. And we may have a clearer picture of what's going to be uh, the situation next year in terms of how the arts can function. Um, so I think if we can tentatively look to have another meeting towards the end of um, towards the end of uh, February and, and the start of March, we can start to uh, listen to our external um, arts providers a little then. Um, so I don't know if anybody uh, has any comments on that or wishes to uh, disagree profusely or... No, well, okay, that's fine. And the other thing I would like to say is, is with the forum's permission, it would be good to put out a, um, a short press release through the comms team about today just to... Uh, Okay, Jeff has his thumbs up. That's good. Um, just to uh, sort of say what we what what we've spoken about, and just a little bit of a a little bit of a pat on the back to the to the district council, and just you know, as as part of the process of getting things out there about everything that's gone on and all of the plans that we have for this year. So I'll um, I'll have a chat about that with Charlie. Okay. Yes. Um, is everybody okay? Okay. To Charlie, I'm getting lots of feedback. I think. Brilliant. Um, just yeah. So just before we go, does anybody else uh, wish to speak at all? No. Okie doke then. I now have to read from my script. That brings up. Yeah, that was read. Oh. I just had one thing to say, just suggested that it's 10% yeah, off it. in the THC shops for um, council employees. It's just 10% off in the THC shop and exhibition. So I hope to see you all there. Okay. It's just a bit of promotion. <laughs> Shamelessly. My pleasure. Uh, we'll include that in the um, in, in any press release if you want. <laughs> Okie doke then. And one for me, actually, Chair, very quickly. Okay, um, we, we spoke about it very quickly um, when we had a little chat. We've got the, our cultural um, strategy up for review um, next year, which would be a great opportunity to, to feed in um, a, a lot of you know, what we've been discussing today. And that's why it's really important to, to, to say to do the listening mode you know, with our really important um, partner organisations to, to make sure that you know, we're, we're synergising, obviously, with um, the new council plan that's coming through. Um, and that we're all kind of on message um, because there's a lot of really good stuff, you know, as John said, in the statement of intent that will feed into the council plan around our sort of arts and culture agenda. So I think the timing, you know, could be absolutely perfect. A bit of serendipity there for us, maybe, um, if we sort of tie that one in. So uh, that will, that's definitely an agenda item for a future forum meeting next week. And to hear, you know, partners such as Villages in Action and Southwest. Uh, museums partnership as well really important to know how they're getting on and i'm quite tempted to um, invite someone from the arts council who's uh, our local rep down here to give us the national picture what their strategic priorities are you know sort of post-covid how we fit in you know as a sort of significant provider to local authority you know and um you know get that sort of sense of you know what is you know ahead of us in the next 12 18 months how does that sound does that look a good agenda Absolutely brilliant. And does that does the timing of that fit in with uh, sort of the various plans that you mentioned there? So sort of towards the end of February time. Yeah, we'll do. I'll, I'll get the word out um, and see who we can get along. I'll, I'll need to talk to Sally 
Kyla, obviously, you know, um, is a sort of key partner. And I'll, I'll, obviously, I mentioned uh, Angela as well, our events officer. So that could all sort of tie in neatly. Um, with the cultural plan review, I think that should be a separate meeting because that's quite a chunky thing and we need to get lots of interaction. Um, we have to convert, um, that Paul on his bike, um, Paul Miller. Oh, um, Councillor Miller. Ah. So, oh. um, so, so yeah. Tyre's so, up, though, so that's great. Um, so yeah, no, that sounds great, Charlie. That, that sounds brilliant. Okay. So, <laughs> Councillor Miller. Sorry, everybody. That's okay. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, seeing as we're all... I'm going to have to say this now. Seeing as we're all fairly tired Another now, standards complaint. Oh, boy. Oh, dear. Well, you did just step over my brilliant pun, so thank you, uh, Councillor Miller. I must say your video is on again, Paul. Okay. Right. Um. <laughs> I'm not sure if he's done his cycle proficiency, uh, so I maybe so. Well, that's just through to enjoy. I think they mentioned taking part in a Zoom meeting whilst you whilst you're cycling is part of that. Um, yeah. Well, if there is such a thing as um, Zoom meeting, you've been framed. That will feature in it. Right. That brings our meeting to an end. I'd like to thank everyone, including any members of the public watching online for taking part. Can I just remind all those present that the sporting officer will confirm when the meeting is no longer being recorded or going live. And then your comments will be live to the public um, and that your until then your comments will be live to the public. Thank you very, very much, everybody, for attending and special thanks to the front wheel of Councillor Miller's bike.